So we are back in the studio in London in Soho and I'm here recording season 16. I can't actually believe we're on season 16. It's mad. But Food for Thought is here and we've got a whole incredible lineup of guests talking everything from gut health to our skin to the environment from male anorexia. We've got some huge topics in this series. Don't miss out. We're living in an age where the science of brain health is emerging, which is great. And the understanding of the human mind is advancing more than ever before. And we now have the knowledge and the tools to not only protect our brain health, but to optimize it, which is pretty cool in this ever demanding world that we live in. So this week's Food for Thought sees the fantastic Dr. Tara Swart. She's a renowned neuroscientist, former psychiatrist. She's a best-selling author and helps us understand the relationship between our mental well-being, the stress, and unlocking our full potential. I mean, I need this episode. I think we all do. We need to explore how we can use the power of our brains to achieve peak performance, resilience, but more importantly, of course, improve our general well-being. So hello, Tara. Hi, Ri. Wow, how long has it been since we last saw each other? Welcome back to the studio. <laughs> <laughs> the same studio. The same studio. We have mountains to catch up on since pre-COVID. The world has changed completely and yeah. we want to talk about our mental health now because I think obviously everybody was impacted by COVID. Mm-hmm. And this isn't a sole um, discussion today on the pandemic, but I feel it's a good place to start mm-hmm. because your first book was back in 2019 and then everything just went crazy, right? Yeah. Have you noticed in your line of work, obviously with what you do, a huge transformation? Huge. So the first two weeks of lockdown, all my work was cancelled. Yeah. And I'd been planning to take a sabbatical. So people, my friends were like, oh, you can finally take your sabbatical. And I was like, well, I'm locked up at home. It's not exactly no, thank the, you. the sabbatical yeah. I dreamt of. <laughs> no. But within two weeks, I was busier than ever. And I know that some people lost their jobs and, yeah. you know, couldn't work. So I, I'm not trying to compare it to that. But in terms of the need for mental health mm. help, I, I felt like I had to do it. I mm. had to try to help however I could. So a lot of it was unpaid, but I was yeah. just doing as much as I could. Yeah. Um, And I started to realise pretty early on that the mental health consequences of this were going to be bad. And then, you know, that clearly panned out and for a lot longer than we thought. And then when it ended, if you like, you know, let's Mm. say Freedom Day. Yeah. um, I also thought the consequences of what we've been through are going to be much longer than people realise. And I'm, I'm seeing that pan out. So in my clients and friends, loads of relationship breakdowns, lots of health problems. I think that may have been underlying but were accelerated by the stress um lots of substance abuse and anxiety Mm. you know Mm. people are constantly asking me for a therapist because they can't get booked into one so it's a lot it's sad i do feel that a person on a personal anecdotal level Mm. i gave birth in the first peak wave my mental health's never been the same since And it's okay. I mean, I'm fortunate that I can afford to pay for a private therapist yeah. who I have and I work with weekly. Yeah, That's an expense people don't have access to, which is why understanding your mental resilience and mm-hmm. having, I think, a self-awareness mm-hmm. of what triggers you is so mm-hmm. important. And mm-hmm. I think the line of work that you're in is absolutely fascinating because we've never known so much about the brain before. I can see, I can see, <laughs> I love it because you get so excited about it and we need to find a way to manage this crazy world we live in. Mm. The anxiety, my anxiety has never been so bad since the pandemic. Mm. Why do you think that is? Is it the social interaction, even getting in the studio today to record this episode? Because I haven't come in in three years to central Mm. London to do something Mm. like this. I was kind of gearing up to it. I don't know why I, I could do this in my sleep, but it's like, it was a thing, became a thing. I totally get it. When I had to do my first big podcast, um, after not having, you know, gone somewhere yeah. to do things yeah. like that for a long time, I was actually crying on the Zoom to my team before, a week before, saying, I don't know, I can't trust myself that I can perform in the same way that I could. Mm. And I likened it to women taking maternity leave from yes. work and having a confidence crisis. Oh, yeah. So you had your maternity leaves during the well, pandemic. Well, well, I didn't get it. You didn't, yeah, you didn't, leave. yeah. And equally, because I'm self-employed, mm. which is psych- another whole issue, is equally psychologically damaging because you're trying to maintain a business at the same mm. time as learning your new identity. Mm. But for those women that could have got a year maternity leave in a pandemic, yeah. you didn't get one. Yeah. So 
So you're kind of experiencing the knock-on effects of that. You know, it's the same having been out of the world of or work or whatever it was or living in a different way because mm. you've got two young kids. You're having to come back and you will unconsciously be putting pressure on yourself that you must be as good as you were before. Yeah, yeah. Consciously Absolutely. or unconsciously. And yeah. I think maybe everybody feels like that socially as well because there must be also something that we can do and something we can control every single day. So... Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've got loads of advice for our listeners, but how on earth do we implement dietary changes for our brain, which is obviously the key focus of this type of conversation today, and deal with the bombardment of serious issues in the world right now? Mm -hmm. And this is kind of a two-pronged question because mm. I'm overwhelmed with the environmental issues at the moment, the sustainability, the mm. crisis of the planet. Mm. The, there's a lot of big, big things going on for us all. Yeah, and you say it's two-pronged, but it's actually, it's it's all about what you're intaking, whether it's food or news. Yeah. It's what your brain-body system is yes. taking in. Yes, yes. Um, and so it's important to be very mindful about both of those things. Um, some good things came out of the pandemic, like mm -hmm. in terms of our understanding. So things like time in nature, mm -hmm. the benefits of that on your health, your mental health, your longevity are huge. Mm -hmm. And I think people really got into that and... You know, it may be harder now that people have returned to London if they moved out and stuff to get the same thing. Mm. But like knowing that that was good for you and your mental health is really important. There was um, definitely a surge of people moving out of the cities, wasn't mm. there, around that time? Mm. People were like, I can't be cooped up here in this, I need to get out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that may have then been an opportunity to connect more with nature. But then equally, there were people in small flats in London that without a garden that were stuck yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, I actually did a reel recently about why as a neuroscientist I don't watch the news and it got a lot of I saw it Did it you? went viral and I don't watch the news either since my PTSD and the panic that mm. I had mm. but I think that for you to say that as well had more of an impact for people to think oh hang on there's no harm in not being so up to date with this negative information yeah I mean it's and I think so most of the comments were, I stopped watching the news and never felt better. A few people, I think, misunderstood it and thought that I had no idea of what's going on yeah, in the world, yeah, which isn't true it. at no. all. But So, for instance, when I was living outside of London during the pandemic, I was growing my own vegetables and had a compost heap. Yeah. Now that I've moved back to London, because of where I live, I can't give my food waste in for composting. Mm. And... So I have literally given it to friends, taken it to their houses, so frozen it, walked to the tip, which is a 40 Aww. minute walk, because I know that if I can't do that and I start chucking it in the bin, I'm I'm becoming disconnected from the cycle yes. of nature and it's too important to me. Yeah. Um, I l thank you for sharing that because we were just um, talking, I had another guest on today in the studio and we were mentioning the fact that we've only got 4% of the world, the wildlife left and everything, the biodiversity, we are so disconnected from nature, it's terrifying. Yeah. Well, I'll take it a bit further than that, yeah. really. I think we are the most lost, lonely and disconnected from ourselves, other people and nature than I think ever in humanity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that statement in itself is powerful and overwhelming and when you said that I felt this kind of surge of I can relate to it and equally the sadness that comes with it because how have we got to this point? I know I mean I think that the pandemic did influence it because we became so much more comfortable being on screens and not socializing and stuff. I noticed myself that my social circle shrank so mm. when I was going back and forth between London and the country, I would see the same four or five people over and over again because they were the people I was in touch with most. So I've made a really conscious effort to reach out to mm. people I've lost touch with mm. or just make, be more proactive about making yeah. effort to see people that I don't see all the time. So, so there's that, but there's also being mindful about your screen time. You know, maybe you don't need as much screen time as you've got used to. Surely it can't be normal to consume the amount of information we do. So... Isn't there an evolutionary theory? I don't know how this applies back to neuroscience. No, but it does. It does directly apply back because evolutionarily we're meant to be around people, but equally we're not meant to see what's going on in the neighbouring tribe. Mm. Is that some kind of theory? Oh, that's a cool new yeah, one. Yeah, I don't yeah. know where I've picked that up from. Probably some meme on Instagram, which goes to show I'm also <laughs> consuming too much content. But it opened my eyes to why do I need to know what's going on over in America right now in this gym? Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know yeah. why. Just... I think... 
I think we need to know what is going on in the world that's yes. important, like you said about the environment, yes. for example. But you don't need to remind yourself 10 or 50 times a day no. that it's bad. Exactly. You can know it and then do whatever you can to contribute to it. Yes. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get to. Like, if you know that you're doing something, whether it's recycling or composting yes. or eating less meat or, yeah. you know, taking less planes, then it's easier to cope with that stuff too. So you have to do both reduce the constant bombardment but also give yourself evidence that you are doing things to stay connected mm. um you know the tribe we yeah. had to be part of a tribe to survive yes and this would be both like to huddle together for warmth but also for emotional warmth you know yeah. we really need that and there's a study from stanford that shows it was done in teenagers but it shows that the amount of time you spend online compared to the amount of time you spend face to face yeah is important. So if you spend a lot of time online, it's okay if you also spend a lot of time face to face. That's good to know. That's positive for people yeah. to know. But if you spend lots of time online and you don't you really see people, face. that's bad. Mm. Um, and if you don't spend much time online, but you also don't spend much time mm. with people, that's also not good. I guess uh, uh, they must do research into care homes, surely, because that must be an example of being isolated and not having the interactions, surely, that people of that age group require but equally this this pans down and now I'm a mother I've got a different kind of perspective on mm -hmm. this type of thing and I'm thinking right what extracurricular activities can I get my children involved in if they're going to be spending their time you know I want them to have a core group of friends growing up mine was the local amateur dramatics group mm -hmm. but then I didn't have screen time to contend with mm. I wasn't on screens all day long as a child and I think how on earth this conversation has gone way beyond um <laughs> what I was intending to have but it does make you think how on earth do we get that equal balance? If people don't listen to this podcast, how do they know that study and know that there's something they can do? Yeah, I mean, I think podcasts are actually amazing because, yeah. and, and one of the reasons is that you can multitask whilst you're listening to a podcast. Yeah. You can't if you're watching a screen. No. But, you know, I mostly listen to podcasts when I'm cooking. Yeah, meet it or on the go, commuting. Yeah, commuting. Commuting yeah. and cooking. Yeah. Yes. So let's just go back to some of your points. Okay. So. We know that the deterioration of old people when they go into a care home is like this. Yeah. It's massively down. Um, part of that is uh, cognitive, lack of cognitive stimulation. But mm. an interesting point there is that if you eat food that's hard to chew, that contributes to your cognition. But what do they feed people in care homes? Mushy food. Mm. So there's a, a lot of things going on. I, Because I knew I wanted to be a doctor... I volunteered in, you know, old old age yeah. homes from like my teenage. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I saw it um, a lot, and and then with children. So I, in terms of balance, I yeah. I look at my friends' kids and I'm like, how much extracurricular stuff are they doing? And they're well, tired. It does feel like you're um, <laughs> you are managing diaries and things. Yeah. But yeah, and the sleep is so important, right? It's this. Uh, well, so I think I'm not there yet. Mine are three and one. Yeah, so yeah. Mine still go to bed at like seven, <laughs> which is a good, great. <laughs> and the other thing is, I think it's very hard to keep them away from screens. Screens yeah. are designed to be addictive, and also if they're not tech savvy, that's not really going to serve them later in life. So I think, I think it is about balance. So I think definitely some extracurricular activities. Yeah. And when I when I think about how crazy it is now, I think well, I was learning the violin, doing yeah. drama classes, doing sport learning other languages, you know, doing dance. So, and I, now I'm grateful that I did all those things and it's contributed to like, yes. you know, the diversity of my brain yeah. and stuff. But it does feel like a lot. Um, That's so interesting. You just said that contributed to di the diversity of your brain. Mm. So the life experiences that we have, mm -hmm. do they build? So you have to excuse, obviously, I'm not a neuroscientist. <laughs> I'm a nutritionist, but does this build new connections in the brain with every experience that we encounter? Obviously, we've been quite privileged to have that type of opportunity. Yeah. So does that improve our IQ or just help with our aging process? All of those things. So so your level of education, just as one thing, but also extracurricular activities, I'll come back to them. Your level of education um, can actually delay the onset of symptoms of dementia. Wow. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you didn't go to university, it's not, it's not just about that. It's about learning new things when you're an adult. So, you know, I try, I take on a neuroplasticity challenge each year, try to learn yeah. something new and different. But as a child where your brain is very malleable or what we call plastic, like neuroplasticity, um, the more different things that you learn, just can, it contributes to what, what are called executive functions, which are your ability to think flexibly, 
solve complex problems, think yeah. creatively. So so it is good, but sleep is important. Well, too. I can <laughs> tell you firsthand, sleep deprivation is horrendous and you cannot function. It's your mood. It's the result on your mood. It's the result on, you know, I did eight months solid, no sleep with my first. Oh, It was so hard to get into it, just the sleep. And I know parents have had it worse. Like it can be up to two years, three years later till their children sleep through the night fully mm-hmm. for a variety of reasons. You do not feel like yourself the next day. Simple tasks every day that you used to do um, become a chore. It becomes really difficult to have a coherent conversation with someone yeah. when you haven't had any sleep. Mm. So what happens to the brain when we don't get enough? Do I want to know? <laughs> <laughs> the damage I'm going done. to give you the bad news first, but then I have Fine. some good news. Okay, caveat it for me, yes. Um, so I haven't particularly studied this in parents, but I've worked with a lot of lawyers who like pull all-nighters yeah. and you know, just like work extremely long days and don't get enough sleep. Yeah. And so what we do know is that after four nights of consecutive lack of sleep or mm. poor quality sleep, your IQ drops by five to eight points. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. And it's the equivalent of turning up to work drunk. Yeah. And you've kind of explained that that's how it but felt. That's how it felt. Yeah. You feel like the first year of life with a baby, for some people, you, you literally feel like you're, you just can't, things don't make sense. The good news is yes, good. <laughs> um, that you are protected by what I call the love bubble. Great. Because when you um, go through childbirth and breastfeeding yeah. and just bonding with the new baby, you release lots of oxytocin. And oxytocin and cortisol, the stress hormone, they're like on a seesaw. So oxytocin is basically protecting your brain against the stress and the lack of sleep. Because there's no evidence that mothers or main caregivers get more dementia than other people has it been studied or if not that's fantastic to know i'll take that one because it is what i find interesting is as a businesswoman and as a health professional running things when Mm -hmm. you have had no sleep it was probably the hardest period of my entire life going through those first early days Mm. trying to even write an email and the words just disappear from your head. It's like you have dementia. Mm. I can only describe it as you're talking out loud right now and mm-hmm. then the word is completely gone and you cannot get the word out mm. that you want to get out. Yeah. But now I've had coherent sleep for quite a long amount of time. Mm. I feel like I'm back to my old self again. Yeah. So this sleep deprivation is serious and you're discussing this in lawyers, mm. people that this is their livelihood. What yeah. about people that do long shifts driving trucks, lorries? That's quite scary. Yeah. Yeah, it's really scary. I mean, shift work is another thing that people are concerned about. Yeah. And it is concerning. But, you know, what I remember from when I was a junior doctor, in that first year, you were just tired all the time. It's probably similar to... Yes, definitely, yeah. Um, But if you think, okay, the only way I can get through this is just work and sleep, then your dopamine levels will get eroded because there's no reward, there's no joy. Yeah, there's nothing to get back. So... If we talk about dietary factors, what about little things people can do if they do have to work shifts? Perhaps they're a Mm -hmm. surgeon or Mm -hmm. they're doing a night shift in a shop somewhere. They need to make ends meet. This is what they have to do. Mm -hmm. Drinking more water, basic things like that. Yeah, so the first one, which is just connected to what I was saying, is that bringing some reward into your life, and that can be food. So it could be like a square of dark chocolate or a hot, you know... cacao drink or something yeah. but but it's about making those food choices healthy okay because it's very easy well with, which is what I did when I was a junior doctor was just have loads of cups of tea and like toast as treats I am a nutritionist <laughs> just to put everyone out there and I, I was a sugar monster when my son was born I was complete and just reliant on anything that could give me a bit of a hit yeah so and I know better so just to say I'm trying to humanize it because <laughs> yeah, yeah. honestly no one is perfect and but there are things you can do which if you can swap in healthy snacks mm. then you're doing two things you're getting the healthy thing like let's say nuts and seeds yeah but you're also because you're filling yourself up a bit with that reducing the craving to go mm. for the direct sugar yeah um i will say to anyone that's sleep deprived i do believe in starting with at least one good meal it's a tip we give in the clinic mm-hmm. if you're going to have a good breakfast do porridge add nut butter add flaxseed mm-hmm. add whatever you can because then mm. at least you're starting mm. whatever time of day it is start off with something nourishing yeah. regardless of where your day goes yeah because that's quite i think a good way for people to get into it so neuroplasticity this is your field tara completely it's a concept many are unaware of mm. so could you explain first of all exactly like we've kind of touched on what it is you said that you challenge yourself every year mm-hmm. to a new challenge 
why should everyone know this term and what it means? Um, you know, when I was at medical school, we didn't know that it existed. We genuinely thought that when you stopped growing, so around the age of 18, that your brain became fixed and that your IQ and your personality you wow. know, couldn't change and it was much harder to learn something like a new language. What we know now, and you know, you've just experienced this firsthand, is that from zero to two, babies go from being completely helpless to walking, talking, sometimes up to five languages, being able to control their bowels and their bladder. And so the growth, that, that's neuroplasticity, what you see happening Is from zero the, to two. the first 1,000 days research? Because that, so apparently, so apparently, this is so. This is my reading from the nutrition angle. Yeah, there's research called the first a thousand days. Yeah. It's with the World Health Organization that from conception to the age of two, the brain grows the most mm -hmm. or takes on the most information. Mm -hmm. So nutritionally speaking, for this is for parents out there with kids, how you feed your children in those first two years mm. can significantly shape the outcomes later on. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. so I mean, all... the brain is growing at such a rate; it definitely yeah. needs a lot. The brain's resources are food and oxygen. Yeah. So they need to be not sedentary. No. And they need to eat, you know, really like brain healthy food. So we all do though. But it's, it amazes me that at medical school you weren't aware of this term. It's because it, it literally hadn't, there'd been no research wow. done. Like it's it, so new. That's the thing about neuroscience or science is it changes all the time. And that's yeah. incredible. Um, so, so what we do know now is that the brain actively grows and changes. There's a pruning phase in the teenage, which is where you get rid of things you don't really need and you become more like about socialising and emotion. I like that, the pruning phase. Yeah. It's a good term. <laughs> um, you know, anything you don't use will get pruned away and, and um, like... Is that why we lose art and it's totally different? But is that why our memories, we just kind of start to focus more on areas, you know, you forget about things that happened when you were three, four, five... Yeah, that, that's one example. I always say you remember what you pay attention to mm. because a lot of people say, oh, my memory's going, am I getting demented? And these are young people. Um, I think it's the screen stuff, the bombardment with information that is, is eroding all of our memories. But um, you're, you're perfectly right in what you've just said. But another example is like if you did learn a language at school, but then you never used it after school. That was me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did French a year early because apparently I was good at it. Yeah. Oh, I really wasn't looking back and then never focused on it ever again. Yeah. So that's been overwritten with other stuff yeah. that you use your brain for. Yeah. Wow. Um, so the brain actively grows and changes till we're 25. Okay. And that's, you know, that's an interesting social phenomenon because people tend to stay at home longer, be more financially dependent on their parents for longer. And this actually makes sense in terms of the fact that their brain hasn't matured to you know, it's level until they're 25. Um, and then from 25 to 65, or even 70, I would say, if you don't, if you have, if you do the same thing every day, if you do the same job for your whole career, if you have a routine, then your brain will tend to plateau. That's not a bad thing necessarily, no. but you can do things to stimulate it and help it to grow and change throughout your life. And the best things you can do in adulthood I'll learn a new language or learn a musical instrument. Great. It has to be attention intense enough to actually change your brain. So not just listening to a podcast. If, but if you learn something from that podcast, something, you know, really new Then you and have paid attention to it, of course. Because yeah. I'm, I'm currently obviously selfishly sat here thinking, oh, thank goodness I do podcasts because I'm learning every week yeah. something really new and facts mm. that are, are mind-blowing. So really, we're saying that we just need to keep experiencing life. Mm, new things. Yeah. But, but bizarrely, because of technology, we seem to not be doing that in the mm. same way as before. No. Is there a difference? So for instance, someone might say, well, I'm learning to learn piano. I'm doing piano, interactive piano lessons rather than physical piano lessons. Would there be a difference in the impact on the brain? By interactive, do you mean... As in, I don't know because I've never done it, but I can imagine a keypad on the screen that you touch where you learn to play it oh, digitally rather than, okay. do you see what I mean, than yeah, actually yeah. doing the physical skill in person because a lot of people have access to a piano and they're like, well, yeah. I might want to learn piano, but yeah. I could do it on the internet. I mean, they're both learning, Okay, but I think th the physicality yeah. is an additional way of learning. So that's an it? additional benefit because yeah. you're having to focus on it. Mm. It's so interesting. That sort of thing to me is how do we 
for people that do use technology all the time, how do you use it to your benefit? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned something when you came in about ancient rituals and going back to, I guess, regaining focus. Yeah, so what I've really discovered recently, because I've been researching various different indigenous cultures and ancient wisdom, is that everything that we need to get back to finding ourselves, being connected again, um, you know, understanding how important it is to spend time in nature, there's science that says that. Yeah. Everything's been hiding in plain sight. Everything's been around for millennia. We've just become disconnected from that. Yeah. So, you know, when we, I, I love talking about evolution like you yeah. do too. When we yeah. lived in the cave, we walked barefoot in nature. We looked at the stars in the sky at night. We sat around the campfire. We interacted with our family. We cooked. Um, you know, a lot of us don't do any of those things there anymore. There is nothing like that feeling of... Because I equally realised recently I have not been outside enough. You get to that point, mm. but you feel better for it. Mm. You get to the end of the day, there's a different type of tired when you've spent the day in nature. There's mm. a different type of satisfaction to even getting in from a chilly walk in the rain. Mm. It, there's something so wholesome and... Re I can't describe the word. I know. But we are so disconnected from it. Yeah. So give me a few of the ancient wisdom. So nature's one. Nature is a massive one. <clears throat> um, there's a new field of research called neuroaesthetics or neuroarts, okay. which says that 20 minutes of doing a creative activity per day has huge benefits on your mental health as well. Wow. So being creative, when you know, if you look at the indigenous cultures, they would adorn themselves, they would dance, they would play the drums, um, they would chant, they would hum, they would sing. Yeah. And so those are all e easy things that you can do in your day, literally. I don't know if it's because I've just learnt it, but I do find myself humming songs a lot these Look, days. You're talking to an ex-soprano here, remember? So uh, my life at home with the children is nursery rhymes <laughs> and we get go. we have dance time after dinner. So this is making, just because it's fun. But yeah. actually, I think music is part of the soul. Mm. So this is a holistic conversation we're having right now, probably away from my nutritional expertise, but because of my previous career as a musician, mm. I believe that it benefited me so much mm. to the fact that it helps me regulate emotions. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing outlet, something that can bring such joy and happiness. Mm. And I always, so I go into care homes at the weekend and I do some singing for the oh, residents there. That's, that's been, so lovely. I've, I've loved, I can't describe how rewarding it has been to do this. Yeah. But to see people and the, the carers that are in the homes, the nurses mm -hmm. that come into some particular homes, say, oh, so-and-so, you know, it's the first time I've seen her react to something like this in that way in so long. Yeah. What is it about music and memory? Because we do war, you know, war sets of World War II songs, but mm. it all comes flooding back to them and a lot of yeah. them end up in tears. It, it's in, in a beautiful way. Yeah, so this is in, in this book that I just read, Your Brain on Art, is about the effect of music in um, care homes. Yeah. And that because obviously in dementia, you've lost your memory. Yeah. But somehow people can remember song lyrics. Exactly. And music. From childhood. I can yeah. remember all of the Spice Girls songs from the album. <laughs> you know, not that that's relevant. I can remember the arias I learned in foreign languages, even though I was terrible at language when I went to Royal Academy. So it's, it's uh, how? Music, well, let's just take it back one layer. So you and I might have different taste in art or music, yeah. but every human has existed in nature since the beginning of time so nature is a palette that is equally pleasing to all of us mm. but then music was very much a part of all indigenous cultures and they weren't doing it for fun they were doing it either to like communicate with each other or to tell a story um same with cave paintings and things like that so basically it it is wired into us from the start of being right. human yeah wow Wow. So really what I'm gathering so far is how disconnected we are to the fact where I know there's only 4% of wildlife left. We have eradicated that area of the planet, which is shockingly awful. We are overconsuming technology. We're not meeting together to engage in these art processes anymore. Um, the theatre has sadly become a privilege because it's expensive. Mm -hmm. People can't afford to get access to some of these art outlets. Yeah, but you can read a novel, Re. Yeah. You can go to a free art gallery. Yeah. Um, you can, you can like paint or draw or sing, and it's not about whether you're any good at it no, or not. Exactly. It's just doing it. And there's actually two parts to it as well. It's making or beholding. 
So going to an art gallery and just looking at beautiful stuff is, you know, that's my thing. Um, and then the making part is, f for me, it's cooking. That's my regular one. Yeah. But if I chose to draw or paint or colour something in, it's really not about whether I'm good at it or not. It's, it's just the act of doing it. So everyone listening, you just need to get in the kitchen a bit more, maybe sit down with a pen and paper, draw, even writing your to-do list every week, you could get creative with it. Well, I do mine like a mind map and I do different Lovely. colours and stuff. Yeah. And but I don't really feel like that's a very no, fun but, and creative thing. No, but it makes sense because I'm sitting here thinking, well, all the children at school when we were younger, we that's what we're told to do. We draw. Mm. We just express us. We just get creative. We are taught to make things. We are taught to do these things. And then we kind of lose touch with it the older we get. Yeah, and think about like children you know reenacting like boys re with swords reenacting yeah. fights or whatever and like the tea party that the imagination that goes into pouring an empty teapot into oh, a I cup know. and then drinking it and saying mm, that's delicious yeah we don't do that no anymore. well i do now with my little ones <laughs> but i wouldn't have done before and it's, it's amazing when i watch my um eldest who's three his brain ticking when he goes i'm just off to the shops mummy and he pretends he gets on his little bike he goes down to the bottom of the garden gets like this things mummy I've got you some apples and I've got you and it takes this whole and how much was that he doesn't understand money yet five mummy I'm like oh five pounds excellent but it's amazing the creativity they have yeah so I guess we've touched on ancient wisdoms a little bit I know there's more we could do yeah we could more. also go into blue zones I'm sure there's stuff there there's let, let's touch on blue zones before we do nutrition because I'm aware that I want to pack a lot in well I, I'll, I think I can segue that in quite nicely Fantastic. so I binged watched the blue zones yes. documentary yes uh, the, the limited series and then I re-watched it and took notes great um so and I, I know you've you've just had a guest that's talking about plant-based diets mm. but I, I bumped into her upstairs yeah, yeah, and yeah. I said to her, I, I now eat 30 different plant species every well week. That's incredible. Well um, from the brain point of view, the darker the food, the better. Yes. So, you know, choosing purple sprouting broccoli instead of green broccoli, blueberries instead of strawberries, yeah. etc. Um, I actually just ordered from in my farm box a purple cauliflower. Nice. And it's so beautiful that I don't want to cut it up and Do cook you know it. It's stunning. I've only ever... So I used to get those subscriptions, those farm box mm -hmm. veg that arrived. And I, by the way, I'm ex acknowledging again my privilege here that I'm able to be in a situation to do that because the lack of diversity on the standard supermarket mm. shelf with veg, I just do not understand because we have it. We just don't put it up there. Yeah. And I think the important thing to point out to people about the 30 plants is that it's, um, it's not just fruit and vegetables. Mm. It's spices. Spices, herbs. Pe black pepper, yeah, yeah. Uh, coffee, chocolate, all of it, grains and legumes mm -hmm. and stuff. So, yeah, you know, some of those are more affordable and attainable. Yes, than, absolutely. Um, Cans of beans and pulses, I'm convinced, are just one of the go tos that everyone should have in their yeah, cupboard. Yeah, yeah, I pretty much eat yeah, that every day. Absolutely. Um, Oh, well, Blue Zones, they'll love you then because they go on and on about beans and pulses. I know. This is so good, though. And I think I've been eating them even more since yeah. I watched it. So, and the other things I thought were really interesting were the people in Sardinia who lived on inclines. Yes. And the people in Japan who squatted on the floor, that they didn't fall in old age because that's a big, you know, thing in old age that causes injury or death. Yeah. So just, you know, now if I forgot something upstairs, instead of being annoyed, I'm like, great, I can take the steps. Oh, I like that. The reverse psychology kind of thinking, mm. I'm going to enjoy this because I get to move my body because I'm helping my body. And the way that they're inclusive of older people. So, mm. you know, if if anyone has time, volunteering is so good for you. Yeah. And if you could do that for older yeah. people, that's a double win. Um, the one, so the, I, there were a lot of things I wrote down, which I can't remember all of them right now. Yeah. But at the end, it said, knowing what makes life worth living. Yeah. And I wrote Ooh, that down. That's big. And then I thought I could just leave that. And I'll probably get busy and distracted and not think about it. And I thought, no, I am going to write down 10 things that I think make my life worth That's living. That's actually harder to do than you think, actually. I sort of, I started and then I got a bit like slowed down yeah. and then it just kind of came pouring out. Wow, because you really focused on it. Can I ask you what a few of those were, if you don't mind sharing? Yeah, they were um, love, yeah. laughter, friendship, yeah. fun um being in nature having a purpose that doesn't serve me but it's mm. like for others work travel yeah I'm trying to think what the other two any are. values is that something that you'd like um compassion or 
those sorts of things or is that a I didn't put those are more like things I would put on my gratitude mm. list but things that make life worth living I was trying to think of like the things that you know I wake up and think I really want to do that yeah. and that's why I you know get yeah. up and like move through my day with purpose. that should be a little take home for everyone listening right now just have a think about that question mm. and write 10 things down because I'm going to do that tonight before I go to bed but like you I'm going to tell myself I'm not going to get distracted by other things I'm going to do it. I have to ask you as well about any dietary tips you could give our listeners. So omega-3, perhaps you've mentioned dark coloured um, foods. Mm-hmm. Med- what should people be doing? Is it Mediterranean style every day? Um, I I am very careful about using that phrase because it yeah. can be interpreted as pasta and pizza. <laughs> yes, well, yes, it could, which is absolutely, of course, delicious. But it's very different, the pasta and pizza here, to what you probably get in Italy. Anyway, it's a whole other... So one of the things that came up in Blue Zones was they do eat quite a lot of carbs, but they have sourdough in it all and that makes it easier to digest. So that helps. And just going back to what you were saying about how we've decimated the planet and the animals, we've decimated our own gut microbiome Mm. as well. Mm. So I actually think that's a very important place to focus. And, you know, because of the gut brain connection, it's not just for your gut, it's for your brain Mm. too. So eating fermented foods like kimchi, sauerkraut, kefir, kombucha. Yeah. I will have at least one of those every day. Wow. I soak my chia seeds in kefir, so I'm getting double. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Um, And being mostly plant-based is is ideal. But for the brain, eating things like anchovies and mussels and sardines, um, you know, a few times a week is important. If you can't or don't want to, then, you know, a vegan supplement with omega oil. An algae Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I love the fact you said that because I was doing some research for a written project I'm working on. And oh, what was the number? I know it was under 10. It said that between and our whole lives, we only ever consume around, was it like seven uh, fruit or vegetables? So like the same things that we have in our diet every single week, every single day since we were children. We all have peppers, carrots, potatoes, peas peas, (laughs) and onions. Something like that. And yeah. even the onion's a touchy subject. It was probably yeah, yeah. something more like broccoli or something. Yeah. But they don't have the purple variety and they don't have... Yeah. What people don't realise is that by consuming even different colour tomatoes, mm. yellow, orange, mm-hmm. the different varieties... And peppers. Yeah, you are adding to your diversity. It all yeah. counts. Yeah, that counts as a different plant. Plant point. Yeah, yeah. And we are so disconnected to that. Even that conversation itself, we've got to stop looking at things needing to be perfect because... Carrots aren't meant to start. So, I mean, oh, you mean up. like foods that don't look perfect? Yeah. yeah, that's the problem with the supermarkets. It is yeah. a big problem. Now, I moved out of London towards the end of 2020 when I Zaki was about five months, my eldest. And one of the things I always wanted to do on my bucket list was I want to grow vegetables in my garden. Now, I've got a garden. I lived in a flat my whole life. Lockdown, mm-hmm. I, that was me in a flat, no garden. Mm-hmm. And I've done it. So this year, it was the first year, my youngest is now one. I was like, right, I'm going to do this. It's not as easy as you think growing vegetables, first of all. It's quite difficult. But once you do it, the sense of achievement. My carrots were a disaster. Um, I would say they they turned, they were probably about like a centimetre, two centimetres long. I don't know what happened. They, you, there was so, radishes bigger than that. Really. I know. Like there was so, there was so much greenery, you know, the for- forage that comes off top. Yeah. And I was like, oh, they must be ready to come out because, but I bunched them all far too close together. Oh. Um, and I pulled it kind of out and I was like, oh. And they were just, Are you sure they didn't get eaten by something? So they, they weren't eaten. But what I realised is that I planted them next to the tomato plant really too close and I put them next to an aubergine plant and what had happened, <laughs> I spoke I spoke to some plant guru and they just basically said you're meant to give them a bit, a bit more space in the soil. This plant doesn't grow well when it's next to this plant. Mm. I didn't know that, but it makes perfect mm. sense. They're a species, mm. right? They don't want to be surrounded by the strawberry plant in the... <laughs> anyway, this has opened my eyes to a whole new world and how things shouldn't look perfect. Yeah. So I've been getting the kids to be like, look, here's the tiny ca- baby carrots that we grew. You can chop about two little round coins out of that of carrot. And we did. And we chopped them up and we put them in the food. Yeah. It was still great to do that. And yeah. there's a real sense of I've eaten something that I've grown from the ground. Totally. Which is amazing. So what do you think, as someone in a position of influence, I would say, with the work you do, with the understanding you have, what would be your top tips for people that only have access to the supermarket 
where should they start in terms of looking after their mental well-being and their brains? If you could give us three top tips. That's hard, I know, but... The first one would be to alternate what you buy each week. Yeah. So, you know, you've already said that we have this tendency to buy the same thing. So, and trying new foods as well. So I'll put that into one category. The second one would have to be the, the darker variety of yeah, everything. I love that. Um, and you can, in a supermarket, you can do that with berries. Um, you can do it with some fruits and vegetables mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. Um, and the third one, top tips for mental health. Yeah, it's hard. Well, we haven't really talked about hydration. That's not so Let's much to do with the supermarket. Let's touch on water because we just don't yeah. touch on it enough. And apparently we've got the most polluted waters in Europe. Oh. In the UK, I know. So we, I think the hydration is so important. <laughs> I know I could see the reaction on your face then. Yeah. It hit me as well when I discussed that earlier. But it's, we need to look after our ecosystems. But equally, don't let that put you off drinking water because water's crucial. But, but filter it if you can, exactly. obviously. Yeah. Um, so the brain is made up of fat and water, which is why we need the omega oils. But we also need to drink lots of water. And the, the calculation is half a litre of water for every 15 kilos of your body weight. Nice. Okay. Right, I'm not going to do that math now. I don't actually know what I weigh. But, you know, you can do yeah. a kind of rough estimate to that. It's which not is... actually as much as people think. No. So, it's it, and, you know, I just have a water bottle all the time. Yeah. Because so. people don't, I think there's an assumption that de- being dehydrated, it's actually so much more than just how you feel or the taste in your mouth. It's the concentration levels decline. No, oh, by the time you can feel that you're dehydrated, your memory and concentration and focus will have been absolutely affected. Yeah. yeah, I always feel better when I make a conscious effort to drink more water and mm. I obviously tell my clients the same, but it's one of those really basics we should be doing more. Right, fact or fiction round, are you ready? <laughs> I'm always ready, Ru. Yeah, she is. She's, Tara <laughs> genuinely loves these. Um, okay, <laughs> if you could answer fact or fiction to the following. Napping during the day can improve cognitive performance. Fact. Oh, I need to do that. Hydration has no impact on mood and emotional well-being. Fiction. Sleep quality is more important than sleep quantity for brain health. Fiction. Ooh. It's possible to boost your memory by taking certain supplements. Fact. Meditation should only be practiced in complete silence for optimum benefits. Fiction. Exercise has no impact on creativity or problem-solving abilities. Fiction, you're making this too easy. I know, I know. Well, now I know because the conversation we've had. Um, Low-carb diets can negatively impact cognitive performance due to decreased glucose availability. Fact. That was a bit better. (laughs) Spending time among nature has been shown to have a calming effect on the brain and reduce stress. Fact. Okay. Too much exercise can lead to cognitive burnout and mental fatigue. Fact. We need to touch on that in a minute. Chronic sleep deprivation can increase the risk of neurodegenerative diseases. Fact. That was a fantastic fact or fiction around so quick. Um, I want to touch on two points in that. I was like, make a note on that. Sleep quality is more important than sleep quantity for the brain. So we used to think that, you know, sleep is good for you, you regenerate your cells, you you know, you store your memories and emotions and stuff. But there was some um, prize winning research around 2013 that showed that there's a very active cleansing process of the brain. So there's literally jets that are cleaning out um, the toxins that build up from the wear and tear of, of life, processed food, stress, etc., and that process takes seven to eight hours. So you really need to be in bed for eight to nine hours. Obviously, ideally, you would have good length and good quality. But even if you had really great quality sleep for four hours, that cleansing process can't finish itself. So for that reason, fascinating. That. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. I need to go to bed earlier to fit that in. Um, then too much exercise. So I think we really live in a world where there is a lot of all or nothing. The mm-hmm. mindset exists in a lot of places. Some people are extreme. You can overdo it. So two things here. What you know, the blue zones thing again showed that just being physically active during the day was actually much more advantageous than sitting at a desk all day and then going to the gym for an hour. But the point that I'd love to make here is that There seems to be a renewed appetite for high intensity exercise since the pandemic. Mm -hmm. That's actually very bad for you Mm -hmm. um, because it spikes your cortisol levels. So it actually contributes to stress. And again, who tends to do that? The type A driven, hardworking. Yeah. That's so fascinating. For me, again, this is anecdotal. 
since I stopped doing regular gym workouts and things, I know it's important to do weight bearing exercise, of course, for bone health. Mm-hmm. I'm fitter than I've ever been since not doing the interesting I used to do. And I was yeah. that type A person that would do clinic. I'd get into Harley Street, then I'd go around the corner, do a class somewhere, F45 mm-hmm. something. I'd come back. But now I'm just on my feet all day anyway with the kids. And yeah. I'm, I'm so busy. Yeah. But it's a different type of fitness. Mm-hmm. And it's more enjoyable. And it's better and it's, for you. That's really good to know because yeah. I think there is a big panic out there for people. If I don't go to the gym or I'm not seen to be deadlifting however many kilos people talk about that you're not helping your body well the other thing is that we all i don't know if you did but i did put on weight during the pandemic Do you know what's well, different for me because i was pregnant doesn't oh, count yeah. <laughs> but yeah i i'd say the largest bulk of clients in the clinic we've had it was weight gain in lockdown and that was caused by cortisol because mm. cortisol to protect your survival stores fat because yeah. it thinks you're going your brain thinks yeah. you're going into starvation and so if you gained weight because of cortisol and you want to lose weight and you do high intensity exercise you're just adding in more cortisol yeah. so it's not even I've always work. said it's diet above exercise but exercise is important but mm. thank you for clarifying that that's so so helpful right we've got to wrap up somewhere I always find this so hard this went so quickly I know when I talk to you this is nearly an hour and I just think wow it's because our brain is central to our obviously like another organ in the body it's just essential and Mm. the more we learn about it I always find it so fascinating when I talk to you because you've got a lot going on behind the scenes that I want to touch on in a minute I know you've got lots of things to discuss Mm -hmm. but a little food for thought a take home message from me today I guess would be please listen to Tara's advice about the fact that we can help ourselves in every way possible but it Mm. just takes that bit of dedication to to put 10 minutes aside to write those 10 things that you care about or Mm to try and think, well, if I don't have time at the moment to learn a new skill, maybe I will listen to a podcast I can really engage in. Mm. It's given me a bit of motivation to want to keep learning, if I'm being honest. Mm. Um, So if you could share food for thought with us today, just an overall take-home message, what would it be? Um, Something that I really want people to feel at the moment is that because of the potential in your brain and because of neuroplasticity, you are so much more capable and amazing than you think you are. So where you might be feeling stuck, I would suggest changing 10 things by 1% rather than trying to make a big change. Wow. That in itself, I think, is really uplifting. You know, you can do something. It's amazing, whatever age. Now, there's so many things to discuss. Where can our listeners go to learn more about what you're doing, Mm -hmm. about your book, about projects that you have? Mm -hmm. Fill us all in, please. Um, so I'm most active on Instagram, where I'm at Dr. Tara Swart, yes. D-R, Tara Swart. Um, and I tend to put everything I'm doing on there, so that's kind of like the portal. But my book, The Source, which came out in 2019, I can see from Instagram it's had a massive resurgence yeah. during the pandemic and, again, recently. Um, and I launched a podcast last year called Reinvent Yourself with Dr. Tara, and it's about to come out again on October 4th. And Amazing. that will include the themes of ancient yeah. wisdom. Oh, so if we want to go into that deeper, which I definitely do, I will be tuning in because I, like so many of you listening, have become disconnected. There's no doubt about it. In fact, probably we all have. So we all need to be doing active things to get back to that. Tara, thank you so much for giving up your time today and coming into Central and doing the podcast with me. It's just so nice to see you again, <laughs> yeah, honestly. It's just too. like... That was the reason I wanted to come. But then we've had such an incredible conversation (laughs) as well. Thank you, Tara.